Love You to Death, Stan Krejcik Mystery, second in the series. Writer, Grant Michaels, publisher, St. Martin's Inn, New York, 1992, narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 1, The Party's Over. Have you ever tried to diet? I don't mean the prefab kind with the cans of Tremulax and the frozen entrees. I mean the regime with the yum yum veggie sticks and the high fiber crackers and the water. Water, water, water. The inexorable 10 8 ounce glasses? Or is it 8 10 ounce glasses? Of agua every day. Drink and chew. Chew and drink. When you're not doing that, you're peeing. And through it all, you still want real food. You even dream about it. Recurrent visions of Reuben sandwiches, french fries with a side of blue cheese dressing. Just for dipping. Or something lighter, like a slab of chocolate amaretto cheesecake with a brandy Alexander chaser. Awake or asleep. You can almost taste the fat-filled, flavorful fantasies, only to be dashed by the reality of carrot sticks, bran wafers, and that goddamn water. And then what? The ultimate challenge. You're invited out. That's right. After resigning yourself to dietary deprivation, after nights of noshing alone in front of the television, after your thumbs are calloused from pressing the channel scan button, and your gums are raw from all the air-popped, unbuttered popcorn. After all of that, people now want you at their posh dinners or their fabulously catered parties. Suddenly, you're the most popular boy in the city. So what do you do? I'll tell you. First, you find the darkest hogs in your wardrobe that you can still get over your hips without rending the fabric, or else you go out and buy a new outfit, all pleats and over blouse to conceal them lard. Then you get your hair cut in a style that brings out the angles and planes of your face, wherever they're hiding, and then you step out. You promise yourself you're going to be good at the party. You mutter those absurd affirmations. I am a slender person. I am leaf. I will be satisfied with blanched broccoli and sodium-free seltzer. But temptation wins, as it usually does, and you end up eating yourself into a coma, diving repeatedly into that roving platter of hot puff pastry appetizers, nabbing two or three with one graceful swoop of the wrist, with nary a butter-soaked crumb falls into the plush pile carpet, cushioned the kidskin pumps on your feet. Get the picture? The gala reception was for Le Jardin Chocolatier, an exclusive candy store about to open its portals in Boston's Copley Place. Their timing was perfect since Valentine's Day was less than two weeks away. There'd be just enough time for a frenzy of sweet holiday purchases in the new shop and another boutique enterprise would be launched. The big party was Sunday night and the best time for the working class to be out carousing, but then these weren't exactly working class folk. Besides, I could pretend to be just like them. Since tomorrow morning, I wouldn't have a care in the world either. As a hairstylist, Monday is my day off. Three hundred highbrow guests milled tastefully about in a large ballroom at the Copley Plaza Hotel, entertained by a salon orchestra superb food, and one another's dull wit. I was feeling like a proud yinta at a wedding reception since I had introduced the two young professionals who were launching the new business. They were both clients at Snip's Salon, where I create my grand designs on Newberry Street, just around the corner from Boston's Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Liz Carlini, whose wild raven hair I cut so expertly, was the business savvy behind the venture, and Dan Dougherty, whose dark, springy curls I simply like to get my hands into, was the imaginative designer who'd set their products and image far beyond anything in existence. The theme of La Jardine was flowers, and Danny had taken it to the dimensions of Grand Opera. 
one specialty item, liquor drenched, chocolate covered rose petals arranged in a glorious blossom atop a slender candy stem complete with sugar crystal thorns and marzipan leaves. They are divine and they cost a king's ransom, but the bread and butter of the business is the truffle à chocolate, known to us plebes as a chocolate truffle. A gob of dark chocolate, sweet butter, heavy cream, and pure flavoring all mixed together, then dusted with cocoa or dipped in more chocolate. It's the kind of stuff that keeps chocologists booked. For me, though, the party was a perfect way to relax after a hectic week at the shop. There were no late appointments, no whining customers, no chemical surprises. All I had to do was stand around with a tumbler of good bourbon and napkin full of fattening snacks and watch the fashionable crowd study the woman's hair work and size up the good-looking men. Alas, the pleasant moments were interrupted by a familiar voice accusing me of some heinous crime. Stanley, that is not on your allowed list. The voice was Nicole Albright's. Nikki owns Snip Salon, but she plays the resident manicurist. That way she can easily indulge her passion for gossip. I quickly popped the last of three carb-stuffed bouches into my mouth, chewed the luscious morsel, and swallowed. A gulp of hundred-proof bourbon helped at home. Nikki, I replied. I left my allowed list at the door along with yours. We can both pick them up on our way out. Nicole gave me a cool stare. Tonight, her bottle auburn hair was swept tightly back into a classic chignon. Don't include me in your idle weight loss experiments, she muttered. I eat what I want. I glanced at her thickened west waistline, luxuriously draped with a ruby red silk cocktail dress. It shows, doll. An arched eyebrow, more pencil than hair, was her response to that, though, in fact, Nicole's Sevelte figure was long gone. Left in Paris years ago with her modeling career way before I knew her. Just then a handsome young waiter paused before us with a tray of drinks. Nicole exchanged her empty champagne glass for a full one, and I requested another double bourbon. The waiter rendered a fawning smile, then sauntered off. Nicole sipped her champagne while she scanned the crowd for a peely man. Her eyes stopped on a distinguished gentleman in his fifties, impeccably groomed and endowed with a full head of thick salt and pepper hair. The silvery crown was a perfect complement to his suit. A double-breasted jacket and pleated trousers of gorgeous Prussian blue wool. He was talking pleasantly with Liz Carlini and Dan Dougherty, and I could sense Nikki's pleasure over the man's appearance. I wonder who he is, she said, her machinations noisily at work already. Don't you recognize him? He's been to the shop once or twice. I would not have missed him. I wouldn't think so. That's Prentice Kingsley. The Prentice Kingsley? Of Gladys Gardner Chocolates? I nodded. Serious wealth, Darl. Island home? Minnie, he's also Liz Carlini's husband. They're married, she said with disappointment and disbelief. I nodded. Nicole continued. But she's half his age. Not quite, but look who's calling the kettle black. With you and that man child from Harvard Business School. What's his name? Rod Love? He's finished law school, Stanley, and his name is not Rod Love. It might as well be for all the use you get out of him. Nicole glowered. You never know when you're going to need a smart young lawyer, which Chaz certainly is. Besides, I'm not married to him. You couldn't be, with any discretion, doll. You're old enough to be his mother. That's not why I'm not married. But I wonder why Liz Carlini didn't take her husband's name. 
Isn't the kingly tag an acid in Boston, asked Society? Maybe, if you spend a lot of time in the Athenum. My guess is that Liz just doesn't like having to sign all those dividend checks. Elizabeth and Carlini Kingsley. It is quite a mouthful, said Nicole, which is exactly what I had in mind when a salver of smoked seafood drifted by, carried in the long, dark arms of a beautiful Jamaican woman. It was Laurette Cole, the former receptionist at Snips, now about to manage La Jardine's new store. Though we already missed her at the shop, Laurette's new job was kind of step ahead for her, with more responsibilities and more money. For tonight's celebration, I'd styled her long black tresses with a shimmering cascade of perfectly sculpted finger waves. Nicole took credit for the lacquered nails with crescent moons just peeking out near the cuticle line. And finally, Laurette's makeup glow was courtesy of Ramon, Snip's sexy shampoo gut boy, who'd given up his waning career in Fox finishing to pursue aesthetics. Through a broad smile, Lorette exclaimed happily, I am hoping to find you too! Lorette had two speech patterns. One was an appealing combination of perfect British diction, combined with faulty and inconsistent grammar, which she used when she was relaxed and with people she trusted. The other version was what she called her good speech, which she used in business or with strangers. Laurette also had amber-colored cat-like eyes which could disarm you with their direct and intent gaze. She shifted the large tray into one arm. Then she ran her free hand over my newly shorn red hair. This is being short like a brush. It's the new definition of butch, I said. A crew cut in the middle of winter in Boston. Nicole asked, What are you serving food, Laurette? Lorette smiled politely, too politely as though mocking her subservient role, then explained, Miss Lisa want me to wait on them tonight, so they know me in this store where I will wait on them again tomorrow. I said, Lorette, her name is Liz, not Lisa. I know Venos, she replied, addressing me by my salon name with a broad grin. But didn't I explain once who Miss Lisa is? I mean, for me. She had. Miss Lisa was Laureate's pet name for her... Hmm, well, for her feminine parts. Don't your nether regions have a nickname? Laureate continued. That's why I'm always saying to her, Miss Lisa this and Miss Lisa that. A delicate laugh trickled out after her words when she thrust the platter of smoked seafood toward me, pretending to serve one of the snooty guests. Would you like some fish, sir? Then she laughed more bright heartily, knowing my intimate predilections lay elsewhere. But food-wise, I'm less particular, and I eagerly took one sizable morsel of each salmon, oyster, and eel. Nicole clucked. Diet! It's all protein, I replied as I gobbled the oyster. Laureate offered the seafood more politely to Nicole, who shook her head and said she'd wait for the pâté. Lorette said, I send it to by here. Then she departed and moved on through the crowd. It's a lousy turn for her to have to work the party tonight, said Nicole. Not from Liz Carlini's business point of view, I replied. Nicole returned her gaze to the three guests of honor. Prentice Kingsley, his wife, Liz Carlini, and their friend, Dan Dougherty. Liz was now conversing seriously with another guest who joined them, a crusty old gent who looked as if he'd been dusted off and rolled down from Beacon Hill, attic just for the occasion. Look at her go, Nicole remarked. She's almost attacking that poor old man. It's called networking, doll, and Liz does it with religious fervor. Nicole watched as Liz Carlini insinuated himself into the older man who was cowering under her social assault. With one eyebrow slightly raised, she said, This might be a good time for me to introduce myself to the distinguished, wealthy, and handsome Mr. Kingsley. Ah, now that's called schmoozing, which is more to your taste, Nicky. With all its effluvial connotations, just remember, 
they're married? Stanley, don't project your parochial school morality onto me. I'm simply going to introduce myself to the man and congratulate him on his lovely wife's success. Nikki, you don't do anything simply. She set off toward the trio of honored guests while my eyes followed her distinctive strut across the room. Nicole's posture and gait was like that of a high-strung show horse. Prancing before the judges stand a holdover from her days on the Paris runways. At that moment, though, at least for my eyes, she was outdone by someone else. A dark-haired and dark-eyed stranger emerging from the kitchen. Except for the nose. He could have been a movie star material from the days of romance and mystique. When a smoldering glance stirred the heart more than an exposed crotch ever could, He'd slicked back his hair, but I could still discern a natural barbaric curl under the gel, and there was nothing shy about the nose either, reminiscent of an eagle in profile. He just let go of the swinging door when he looked my way and caught me my admiring glance. He smiled openly, then waved to me as though he recognized me. He motioned for me to join him as he made his way toward Danny and Prentice and the others. I headed that way too and saw him get there just when Nicole did still in her pursuit of Prentice Kingsley, a handsome stranger, and Nicole actually bumped. But he smiled and nodded politely to her. Then he took from firm hold of Danny's shoulders and pulled him away from the small group toward another part of the hall. Nicole, meanwhile, sidled up to Prentice Kingsley, while Liz Carlini seemed a bit distracted by all the sudden intrusions. Seeing his chance, Liz's elder victim took advantage of the lapse in her attention and quickly escaped. With Danny and the handsome stranger out of reach for the moment, I decided to go talk with Liz and steer her attention away from Nicole, whom I knew would flirt brazenly with Prentice Kingsley. Nothing was intended by it except perhaps to upset Liz. The cool, ambitious, sexual businesswoman, the very kind Nicole, detests. Liz seemed almost relieved to see me. It probably comforted her to have someone to latch on to and overpower. She threw a cold glance toward Nicole, who was already maneuvering Prentice Kingsley toward a large table where the entire La Jardin product line was lavishly displayed. Liz said to me, I'm surprised the manicurist from your salon is here tonight. I answered frankly, when you and Danny invited me, you and I said I could bring a guest. I didn't think it was conditional. She blinked nervously as Nicole and Prentice disappeared into the crowd. She seemed worried that Nicole might corner her husband and expose herself, or something equally egregious. Then again, knowing Nikki, I said quickly, Nicole loves to meet new people. I should have added honestly, especially men but I already noticed a defensive tone creeping into my voice. Liz sipped nervously at her drink on a doubtedly pure imported mineral water and spoke again before she'd completely swallowed the last bit, which caused her to cough and sputter a moment. It seemed to embarrass her as though real professional people didn't have the same visceral functions as ordinary mortals. Even simple things like coughing or sneezing were undeniable. She looked out over the crowd as she tried to explain the coughing away. Excuse me, please. I seem to be so excited by this whole event. I'm afraid I'm forgetting myself. Whoever that is, I thought. The errant droplets lingered in her throat, teetering between trachea and esophagus. While Liz waited impatiently for these, their decision, I wanted to tell her to relax her throat, which would help the water go where it belonged. Instead, I remained silent and watched the tears well up in her eyes as she resisted the urge to cough. Finally, after a hyper-controlled clearing of her throat, she spoke again. Benos, there were moments in the past year when I wondered if this business would ever get off the ground. You have no idea of some of the difficulties, she sipped at her water again, as if to prove that she was unafraid of another cough. Meanwhile, I prepared myself to administer the Heimlich maneuver just in case her swallowing reflex was still faulty. But she merely smiled and continued talking. Now we're finally home free and we can start making some money. I didn't know you had any problems at all, Liz, I said, thinking of the relative ease with which a new business can be launched when money is an unlimited resource. 
Was it labor trouble then? I asked. Liz turned her head sharply toward me. Did Dan Danny say anything to you? No, I was just curious. She looked at me suspiciously. I continued. I didn't mean to pry. I was always a bit hurt by Liz Carlini's haughtiness. Most clients want to share at least one deep, dark, serious secret with their hairstylists, especially after they've known each other a while. Liz was strange that way. I'd been doing her hair for two years, and I still didn't know much about the woman under the head of lustrous, dense black hair. Liz shook her head forcefully as though trying to cancel our exchange, as though our words were on a computer screen and she could push the clear button to make the conversation go away as though the past had never happened. From within the crowd, Lorette reappeared before us with the seafood platter, which was less than half full now. Liz spoke sharply to her. Finish with that, Lorette. Then make sure everything is ready in the kitchen for the final presentation. Already? said Lorette. Miss Lisa, there is much more food to serve. Her good speech had been activated. Don't talk back, said Liz. Just finish that platter and get back to the kitchen. I leapt to attend action and rescued the platter from Lorette's arms. I can help with that, I said. I nudged her with my shoulder, aiming her back into the crowd where I wanted to be too, away from Liz Carlini. I turned my head back toward Liz and called out, See you later! I was surprised to see her look forlorn. Had my sudden desertion caused it? As I pushed Lorette along through the crowd, she asked, What are you doing? You want to feed these hungry rats too? This platter gives me a good excuse to walk around and meet people. I cocked my head toward Danny and his handsome friend. Especially him, I said. Lorette shook his, her head and wagged a finger at me. You bad Vanos, she said, and headed back toward the kitchen. I continue on my way toward Dan Dougherty and the exotic young man who had waved to me earlier. The two of them were standing in a quiet alcove, and they seemed to be arguing. Nothing like a good fight to show a person's metal, I say, so I strolled over to them with the platter of smoked seafood as though they were exactly in my intended path. They both looked up as I approached. Danny frowned, but the other man, my obscure object of desire, smiled that charming smile again. Hey, Christian, he called out to me with a heavy accent in French. I thought, and no wonder, he's so friendly. He thinks I'm someone else, probably someone influential. I saw Danny say something to him, but the handsome stranger didn't respond. He was too busy smiling at me. When I got to them, I offered the platter. This is the last of the seafood. Danny seemed surprised. The food is gone already? No, but Liz wants to stop serving now and start the dessert soon. Danny said, It's too early for that. I'll go talk to her. He turned to leave, then said curtly to his friend, We'll finish with this later. Then he walked brusquely away, back into the crowd, to search of Liz Carlini, leaving me alone with the handsome stranger. I couldn't have choreographed it better. How you been, Christian? he asked, with suave, broken English. My name is Stan, I answered. I think you have me confused with someone else. Maybe, but I see you here. It's short and copper, just like Christian. He pronounced the word copper. I had it cut yesterday. He gave a blasé shrudge. So you are not Christian, but you are nice. His dark eyes danced and flirted, taking in me, the party, and the world all at once. Well, you seem nice too, I said. I am Rafik, he said, and extended his hand, his name rhymed with technique. I juggled the platter into my left arm and shook his hand. He held onto mine even after I released the pressure of the handshake. He squeezed it strongly a few times, then as he let go, he pressed his fingers against my palm. I felt a little shiver of pleasure, since his message was clear. Hell, Valentine's Day was in two weeks, and I was as usual single. My last romance with a young Belenese had ended abruptly when he returned to California to pursue a degree in fashion administration, and since most of my friends only wash and wear bridal gowns, I often wonder when it will be my turn for romance, with the flowers and candy and kisses and whatever physical gymnastics 
might follow this sweet, sloppy, sentimental part of courtship. In fact, I was ready for some deep and dirty loving. Are you French? I asked. Yes, non, he said with that killer smile. I am born in Paris, but I grew up in Montreal. My parents is very complicated. But you live here now. Ah, yes, he said with a nod, a sexy, inviting nod. A brief silence followed, and I believe became slightly flustered, as I often do when a desirable man has touched me. He asked, How you know Dunny? He pronounced it Dunny. I do his hair. You are a hairdresser. Yes. But you are so masculine. Why did the word sound more convincing with a French accent? And what was causing this unlikely admiration? Was it my coppery hair freshly cut in a fox butch style? Perhaps it was the reddish mustache hovering over my full lips, which tend to grin easily, or the green eyes. My guess is that it's my big square jaw that appeals to people, though my face is a bit fleshy. It's also blessed with the strong angler kind of bones usually reserved for television, sports, reporters, or lumberjacks. Although rumor has it that some of those he-men trip rather lightly too. So, okay, my jaw is big and manly. Once you know me, though, you'll find it's just a home for tongue and teeth and sass. I'm one of the new breed, I replied. No more limp wrist. We're all brawny brutes now, yanking hair out by the roots. He chuckled and said, You are funny man. I let the remark slip and asked, How do you know Danny and my turn of tit for tat? His eyes looked down for a moment as if to recall a poignant memory. Then he said, We met at cafe. Here in Boston? In Montreal. So you're lovers. Ravik shifted slightly on his long legs. We are friends. I help with business. Then you have a job. Always important to know, especially with charming, good-looking men. He hesitated. Yes. Then he switched on the bedroom gaze. I'd like to see you. Already? You must need a green card. Huh? He replied, puzzled. Are you a U.S. citizen? No, he answered cautiously. You must want to get married, then. Go to bed? That, too, probably, I said with a shrudge. I like that, he said, showing all his white teeth. I'm not sure Danny would, though. From behind me, I heard. Not sure I'd like what? It was Danny, of course. He'd over here. This is me and my timing we're talking about. I explained sheepishly that Rafik and I was just kidding around. Take him, Vanos. I've had enough. No deposit, no return. He's all yours. Danny, I didn't mean... We were just breaking up when you were came over with that tray, you know, so your timing was perfect. I let out a heavy sigh. My playfulness had been misconstrued, and now Danny was having a queen attack. Why didn't Rafik say something to clear the air to calm Danny down? I gave her a resigned sigh and looked down at the tray. I guess I'll finish serving this stuff. But as I turned to go, Rafik held my arm. Excuse me, he said, asking it like a question. It looked across my shoulder into his eyes. He said, Your name is Stan or Vanos? In the shop, it's Vanos. In real life, it's Stan. So, he said with that ever-inviting gleam in his eye, I am real life for you, huh? Danny interrupted our lingering tango. You'd better hurry up with the fish. Liz is in the kitchen burning her rotors to get the dessert served. I couldn't change her mind about it. On the way back to the kitchen, I noticed Prentice Kingsley being corralled by another man, a stocky, broad-shouldered guy in his forties, wearing a plain brown suit. He looked like a former preppy jock gone slightly paunchy. The man was annoyed about something, as though the refined Prentice Kingsley had just snatched an overnight parking space from him. Neither Liz nor Nicole was anywhere near them. The guy was pushing Prentice Kingsley into a narrow, empty service pantry that was remote from the main part of the floor. I skirted around the crowd and went to stand near the opening to the pantry. I trained my ears on their conversation, and I caught a good part of it. 
Bridges, this party is decadent. You have no right. I have every right, John. I always have. You got your mother's money on a fluke. Not a right. But I did get it, John. And now you're squandered it on frivolities. This business venture is not frivolous. In fact, Van Gump of Switzerland has already made a serious, generous bid for La Jardine. I don't meddle in your sordid affairs, dear brother, so please keep your petty complaints and your tiresome envy in check. Half-brother, Prentice. We're half-brothers. That's right, John. You're finally accepted the fact that the Kingsley name and fortune are mine and mine alone. You can keep the Lauf surname all to yourself, along with everything and everyone connected to it. The name rhymed with tough or fluff. At the moment, I couldn't tell which. You and your dead mother's name, said John Lauf. Don't forget your young wife and her young friends, Prentice. They seem to be enjoying the Kingsley money, too. I will not have you insult Elizabeth and Daniel. Their arguments seem to be getting out of hand, and the next thing I knew, Prentice Kingsley and John Lauf came out from the service pantry and were facing me directly. I was caught. I looked down at the tray I was carrying. The seafood was beginning to look a little tired, but it still looked worthy to offer to Prentice Kingsley and his sparring partner. With my best service industry persona, I asked, Would either of you two gentlemen like some seafood? Mr. Loft's eyes narrowed in rage. Leave us alone. Mr. Kingsley said, I must find my wife now. And he walked away without even acknowledging me. But John Loft said, Get back to work. Thoroughly humiliated by the ruling class, I wandered back into the party crowd where Nicole intercepted me. What was that all about? You saw? She nodded. Everything. The esteemable Mr. Kingsley seems to have family problems. He was arguing with his brother about money and property, the usual party banter. But you also struck pay dirt, Stanley. Who was that dark-eyed beauty hanging around Danny? You don't miss much, Nicky. Not men like him. Dark Eyes is Danny's lover, and he's not got a great pair of rounded heels, too. Are you going to spin him, then? Nikki, the next time my ovaries start clacking over a handsome man, just hog-tie me and throw me into the ice bin. With pleasure, darling, but I must insist that you be gagged first. Sure, have you away with me. Anything for a pal. She put her arm around me and hugged me slightly, upsetting the serving platter. Stanny, she said, using the nickname that my Czech grandmother liked. Why don't you go dump that in the kitchen? You're the only one out here still holding food. It was true, and the time since I'd taken the platter from Lorette, all the other servers had long since left the floor of the party hall. I staked my way through the crowd, back toward the kitchen, Along the way, hands appeared from behind bodies and snatched the last pieces of smoked seafood from the silver. By the time I got to the kitchen door, the platter had been picked clean by the starving rich. As I was entering the kitchen, Liz Carlini was coming out. Are you still serving food? she asked curtly. Just returning the empty platter, Liz. Feeling a bit testy tonight? I thought perhaps some light humor might loosen her up. It didn't. The guests need time before dessert, she said flatly. The floor should be devoid of food for at least a half hour. That doesn't sound hospitable. We are not here to be hospitable. We are promoting a new business venture. It was interesting to see one of my clients in real-world action outside the salon. I'd already guessed that Liz Carlini was ambitious, but now I saw that she was unpleasantly quick-tempered under pressure. It seemed an unsuitable trait for working with the public, especially with a company whose product was Ultralux chocolates. In the kitchen, I got rid of my tray and was about to return to the party when I heard Lorette's voice arguing with someone else. It seemed to be a night full of social conflict. I followed the sound of the voices until I found her. She was trying to supervise the preparation of dessert, chocolate truffles, and 
more champagne along with coffee or tea for those of us with more pedestrian needs. But another woman was alongside her, yelling at her and interrupting her work. She was in her early 60s, small and wrinkly, like an irritable old terrier, and she had a henna rinse in her hair that could have only been done in a bathroom or a garage. Keep your fingertips off them, she yelled at Lorette, who was trying to rearrange a large platter of truffles that had been upset. Don't tell me what to do. I don't work for you. You don't deserve to work for anybody here. You're, you island people should go back where you came from. Just leave me, wailed Lorette. I saw tears in her eyes. And you get him out of here too, yelled the older woman, pointing to a stranger standing partly concealed in a dark corner, a few yards from the work table. Then she turned away from Lorette and stormed past me on her way toward the kitchen door. Her angry footsteps seemed too heavy for such a small person. When she was gone, I asked Lorette, Is everything all right? Lorette nodded silently. Who was that? I asked. That is Mary Finney, she said, trying to control a sniff. She hates me because I'm being the manager in the new store, and she wants that job. Then after a moment of calming herself down, Lorette resumed working on the chocolates in front of her. I, I watched her carefully apply a miniature candy blossom to the top of a plain truffle. I noticed two other truffles already decorated with flowers, and each one on its own small sil sterling silver plate. Are those for the guests of honor? I asked. Sure, you're right, answered Lorette, saying the phrase is one word. She finished the job with a small flourish. There she said with a tiny sniffle. She spoke to the chocolate as she placed it on the third silver plate. Now you be perfect too. It was then that the stranger who'd been lurking in a nearby corner, came into the light and slouched against the wall. He stared at Lorette and me. He was young, mid-twenties, good-looking and muscular, like a sort oiled pretty boy from the suburbs. But he also had the cold, manipulative look of an opportunist. He spoke with a weak, raspy voice, as though he needed water badly. What about a piece of for me, babe? He said, then snickering vacantly at his own words as though he was drunk or drugged. Not now, answered Lorette. Who's that, I asked quietly. Lorette frowned and didn't answer me. She obviously knew the man, but didn't want to introduce him. It seemed the approach of Valentine's Day was causing more friction than affection among the loving couples I'd met that evening. Sensing trouble, I asked, Do you want me to stay around? She shook her head no. You go back out and enjoy yourself. But I could tell she was forcing her voice to sound steady and controlled. There's no fun, Lorette, now that the food's gone. Venos, there were being some nice-looking men out there. Don't put all your mind on the food. I wanted to protest that I wasn't one of those people who satisfy their sexual frustrations with food. But it would be futile. I fully realized that the only time that night when I neglected my elementary canal was during the brief and vain pursuit of Rafik. The tough stranger standing at the corner of the kitchen spoke up again. Hey, babe, who is this twink? Can't you get rid of him? On a closer look at the man, he seemed familiar, but I couldn't place him. Had he been to the shop? Lorette scowled at him again, then spoke quietly to me. Venos, please go now. I have work to do. Uneasy, I left the kitchen and returned to the party floor. As I came through the doorway, though many people looked my way as though I might be bearing a new course of snacks for them. Contrary to Liz Carlini's belief, these folks still wanted chow, and since many of them appeared to be couples and presumably more sexually satisfied, I wondered what their craving for unneeded food meant for them. I saw Nicole talking, or rather arguing, with Liz Carlini. I approached them, and when Liz saw me, she turned abruptly and walked away. Liz seems edgy tonight, I said. Stanley, that woman is rude. What happened now? She's making accusations. You mean the same ones women usually make after you're met their husbands? 
Stanley, that remark is uncalled for. Uh, Nikki, even if you do prefer grad students and married men, I still love you. Besides, Prentice Kingsley has troubles of his own, even without you breaking up his marriage. Nicole replied, From what I've seen tonight, no one is too happy to be here, as though the whole event is an obligation and not a party. Amen, doll. Just then, the kitchen door swung open and a long line of servers filled out into the crowd. Uh-oh, I said, the grand finale. Dessert time. Each server carried a tray, some with chocolate truffles piled into pyramids, some with champagne flutes full of bubbly, others with hot coffee or complete tea services. Lorette Cole was with them, but she went to Dan Dougherty, Liz Carlini, and Prentice Kingsley, and presented each of them one of the specially decorated truffles on a small silver plate. She was extra careful about the who got which plate. After a few more minutes, Every guest in the party hall was holding a chocolate truffle in one hand and a champagne glass, or hot beverage in the other. The lights were lowered again, except around the three special guests who now stood apart from the crowd as though they were receiving Olympic medals. The salon orchestra played a little fanfare before each one of the three made a little speech. Prentice Kingsley went first. By helping my young wife, Elizabeth, start Le Jardin, we are continuing the fine tradition of quality and service begun by my great-grandmother, Gladys Clingsey, and which has continued through the family line until my dear late mother, Helen Kingsley. We are proud at this moment, he went on like that, rather too regally, and I thought his words were in bad taste, referring as they did to all the old dead Kingsley ladies. However, the quiet appearance of Lafitte behind me, covertly squeezing my nether cheeks during the spiel, was not in bad taste at all. When it was Liz Carlini's turn to speak, she said, And I'll give the woman credit for bragging so blatantly in public. La Jardin is a new concept in chocolate. We have gone beyond tradition to create new pathways in the art of chocolate making. The days of old-fashioned box chocolates are ending, as I said, empty but in complimentary taste to her husband, words. Meanwhile, Rafik continued his good taste in seduction tactics by whispering into my ear, grazing the lobe softly with his lips. Maybe you take to ride my truck? It sounded like kinky fun until I found out he was the driver for Le Jardin's spiffy new delivery van. Then Danny took the floor, and after glaring at Rafik, and me said, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have my ideas seen by the world. I owe a lot to Prentice and Liz. Enjoy the chocolate folks. Did I mention that Danny was young and idealistic? His words may have been trite, but at least they were brief and honest. At Danny's words, Rafik had disappeared, the little coward. Then simultaneously, all three speakers took a bite of their truffle. Miss Carlini bent into hers, but watched Danny and her husband intimate, intently, waiting for their reactions. For his part, Danny barely had one. I think to him it was just another hunk of chocolate. The better reaction was Prentice Kingsley's, though he is a handsome gent. His refinement borders on blindness, except for what he did at that moment. He bent his head over the silver plate in his hand and spit out his mouthful of truffle onto it. He looked like an obtuse child who couldn't bear the taste of grilled eggplant. The audience gasped at the seeming impropriety of the act. Then we all heard a long, loud scream from the kitchen. At once I recognized Lorette Cole's voice and ran to help her. She was standing at one of the long stainless steel counters screaming at a man lying on the floor who was writhing in pain and making loud, dry, gasping sounds. It was the same person who'd been in the kitchen earlier, the one who'd been bothering her and insulting me. I went to him to try to help him. In my mind, I pressed play to start the mental cassette of the CPR class I'd taken months ago. The man's shirt collar was already open, but I went through the motions of loosening it further. There was melted chocolate in and around his mouth, 
I put my fingers in them and felt around for any blockage to his throat, but came out with nothing. Besides, through the gasping and grunting, I could hear the air going in and out, so I figured the airway wasn't blocked. Where does it hurt? I yelled stupidly as though he couldn't hear me. But the man didn't answer. Instead, he squirmed violently on the floor. Then he lapsed into spasms. I cleared the space around him so he wouldn't hurt himself. Perhaps he's epileptic, I thought. But within minutes, he turned as red as a cooked lobster, and then he stopped moving. Everything stopped. His arms, his legs, his head, his breathing. I felt for a pulse, first at his wrist, then at his jugular. Nothing. Quickly, I tilted his head back, pinched his nostrils, and administered cardiopulmonary resuscitation, given the breath of life had seemed so easy in CPR class, kind of like kissing from the diaphragm. But I can tell you, it's not pleasant when you do it for real, when you're trying to revive through a filthy mouth what you know in your head and heart is to be a corpse. I continued puffing him up for five minutes, then surrendered to the facts of life, the guy was dead. I looked up from where I was kneeling on the floor. Nicole was standing above me along with two of the party's security guards. Behind them, the crowd of guests were gathering in, craning their necks in morbid curiosity. I said to the guards, You'd better lock the doors until the police get here. One of them radioed the crew to seal off the party room and the rest of the building immediately. Meanwhile, I stood up, found a telephone, and called the Boston Police Department to report a dead man. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides, and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.